I, uh, a couple of years ago, I read a, a book entitled uh, The Survivor's Club. It was uh, written by a you know, secular author, and I'd heard some good things about it, read it, read it, very interesting. And um, uh, it's, it certainly incorporated the life stories of not just uh, former POWs, which it did, but uh, people that were in horrific car accidents, a lady that was uh, attacked by a mountain lion, another woman that had acid spilled upon her, just some horrific events that people went through. And then how did they survive? How did they, how did they get through? And uh, the, again, the secular author at the conclusion of hearing all the stories, doing all of his research and so forth, and, and he went to a couple of the SEER schools, uh, the SEER school, Survival, Evade, Resist, Escape training that uh, pilots and, and a lot of other folks uh, uh, in the military go through uh, now at uh, varying degrees, interviewed those guys, saw their facilities and so forth, and came to the conclusion after talking with everybody that the way that people survive is if they have faith uh, in God and faith in God that they believe that he's with them. And if they're in that situation, he's allowed it. Therefore, he's going to get them through it. That was the, uh, the research done by the secular writer. And uh, I know, in fact, from Josh just having gone through Syria a couple of, well, last summer sometime, Air Force does it up in, uh, up in Washington. Pretty, pretty grueling uh, uh, experience, not just the survival training, but you eventually get caught by the bad guys and, uh, and you are tortured. I don't have a problem torturing terrorists. We torture our own guys just to prep them for it, but uh, it's just my own little personal comment there. But uh, uh, he was just saying, man, it was such a, a horrific thing, but your, your faith definitely comes into play. Uh, and uh, when you go through something like that, and uh, Isaac's about ready to go through something very difficult here, uh, and he's going to, in a, in a sense, repeat uh, in the footsteps of his father, uh, Abraham. But there's something very important that we can, we can learn. Again, I want to emphasize the fact that like, when we go through, when I teach through Ephesians 6 and spiritual warfare, I spend a great deal of time on the fact that the primary way the enemy attacks us is through the mind, to bring doubt and fear uh, into our hearts and minds to get us down a spiral of what if this happens and if that happens then that will happen what if I do lose my job there are people losing their jobs what if people I lose my home there are people losing their homes what of those people that are home I could be you know we can get into the what ifs and fear becomes to dominate our thinking we become very reactionary to it and we say that when fear comes in the front door faith goes out the back door these two things do not uh, uh, really live in the same heart and mind simultaneously. They certainly jump back and forth in our own lives, and we're going to see that with uh, Isaac here. He's going to have God come to him on two occasions and say, I am with you. I will be with you. And he's even going to have it reiterated by uh, a non-believer, a pagan king, come to, to him in the end and say, I can tell God is with you. And it's uh, very critical that we, we can kind of hang on to that and, and not go to fear. Very, uh, very interesting little story. Let's take a look at it. First thing we see with Isaac here is the covenant is reconfirmed in the first five verses as a famine will come. There's a famine in the land. Besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you, dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my law. So first thing we note that it's reconfirmed this covenant, this promise, this relationship during the time of famine. And certainly uh, it's uh, a year without rain is very tough. They're living in what we Canaan at the time, we'd say Israel today and very dependent even as they are today uh, on uh, on rain coming. And anytime it happened that there was a drought, then people left in the in the droves. Some very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, um, 
basically drawings that have survived that we have basically carvings of Egypt of people in this migration from Canaan into Egypt about the time of Abraham. So if you kind of wanted to see what people look like, what they wore, what their sandals look like, you know, their, you know, how they groomed, you know, and, and so forth, you can, you can look at this and, uh, and get a pretty good glimpse of what, what it was like because it was a common experience. Uh, Isaac would have been living in Lahai Roy, a place where God had met with him, God had spoken to him, God had blessed him. It's, it's where he met his wife and so forth. It's where he chose to live uh, based on his relationship with the Lord. Uh, and he's looking out and seeing the drought. And if there's a highway nearby, and there literally was highways in those days, and everybody and their brother would have been le leaving in droves headed towards Egypt because, again, they have the Nile, it's a flat land, they can irrigate, they've always got water, they've always got bread, they're always going to do well, even during a famine. Uh, and it would have taken a lot of faith for him to that point to say, I'm not going to do what everybody else I know is doing. It would have taken a lot of faith to, to make that statement and say, God said this, I believe him, I trust him, I'm just staying here. But he doesn't do that. I mean, he knows the story of his father, doesn't he? Uh, but yet at the same time, well, those, those stories are great and they can encourage us and inspire us. But God says, I want you to live through this. I want you to experience uh, what your father experienced. He's being tested in the same way. Was it wrong for Abraham to go to Egypt? Yeah, it says so right here. It was absolutely wrong for him to do that. And we saw that despite how wrong it was, despite the lying about his wife when he gets to the border of Egypt to remember that story, what well, we saw that God blessed anyway. God took care of him anyway. God protected Abraham anyway. It became such a, a great example of grace to us. But it's a time of testing. Would they go to Egypt, which for us, of course, in typology is always a type of the world. This happens. What should I do? Well, most people would just cheat on their taxes. Most people would just do this. Most people would just commit bankruptcy, let it all go back, and then I'll get rescheduled and I'll just go on my merry way. I'll just kiss all this debt goodbye. Most people have done that or are doing that, but would you do that? That's the way of Egypt. But what would God have you to do? You know, so again, there's a lot of application here for us. Do we go down to Egypt in a time of famine? We're going to find Abimelech is here again. Uh, and as we mentioned, when we hit that passage with uh, Abraham, this is really a title like the czar, the pharaoh, the president, the prime minister. Uh, we find uh, uh, the word Abimelech 65 times in the Old Testament. We find Abimelechs who are on the scene during the time of judges. So this guy's either like 500 years old or it's different guys. It's really different guys, different titles. We even have a reference to Phil Call, the commander of the guard again, same, same name. So we assume that that's a title as well. Could it be the same guy? Yeah, the guy could be 150 years old, which is a possibility, but more than likely it's a different guy because when he shows up and he sees Isaac and they have their interaction, he doesn't go, hey, you're telling me the same story your father told me. You know, you, you, we don't really have that. It's really probably a different guy. Again, these are names of uh, dynastic names we refer to him. Isaac's living in fear. So what does the Lord do? Well, the Lord shows up and reconfirms uh, to Isaac, uh, his promise. The Lord appears to him, and uh, what a thrill it must have been to not only have Abraham say to him many times uh, over, the promise is for you. The land, the seed, the blessing, it's all yours. God said so. That's nice to hear. It's also nice to have God show up and say it as well and reconfirm it. And very interesting. Is Isaac being like super obedient in this? And that's why God shows up and says, I want to reconfirm my promise and my covenant, tell you how much I'm going to bless you and how I'm with. No, actually, he's on his way to Egypt. But God intervenes and shows up uh, and appears to him and reiterates the whole promise to him and says, I'm going to be with you. But don't do two things. Don't go down to Egypt. Don't go any further. Don't go further down the road. You know, God says that sometimes through another person or through scripture or through a message. We're, we're going down a certain road that's going to lead to some very bad consequences in our relationship with the Lord and our relationship with others. And God shows up and says, don't go any further. Uh, remember, on a map, uh, they're in the, what we'd call the Gaza Strip today. 
And uh, not a pleasant place to, uh, to live, you know, 125 degrees in the summer in the shade. Uh, very difficult. Water is a very critical thing, as we're going to see. That plays a part in the testing as well as the blessing here as we get further into the text. But uh, basically, he's telling them, you're still in the land, which he was, but don't go any further. Uh, and uh, it's really, again, the graciousness of God to show up and appear to him. And what that means, we don't really know, but God is able to communicate with him. Uh, and again, the two aspects that would be sobering was uh, the command not to go down to Egypt. God is saying, you can trust me. You can trust me in a time of testing. And you can remember the promises and the oaths that I've made to you. Uh, in Psalm 105, verses 7 to 10, the psalmist, looking back, uh, reminds us of this incident. He says, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. That's what, that's what God is saying to Isaac here. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. That's what we just read about. God made an oath reconfirming the covenant to Isaac. And confirmed it to Jacob. We'll read about that in subsequent chapters for a statue to Israel as a, how long? An everlasting covenant. Sometimes we need to be reminded of the covenant we're under as well and the promises that God made to us. And so Jesus tells us to take the bread and take the cup and do this in, in remembrance of me. Meet with me and have fellowship with me and be reminded I'm with you. I don't know whatever you're going through, but I'm with you. And uh, very much the same way that God meets with Isaac here, God wants to meet with us and says, remember the covenant, remember the relationship. The second thing here that would have been kind of sobering is, again, the reference to the obedience of Abraham. And, and, and again, you have to appreciate the fact that God, God could have reminded him of the disobedience of Abraham. He could have reminded him, don't do what your father did. Remember what happened to him? And he went down to Egypt and he almost lost his wife and Lot got a taste for Egypt and it really destroyed him and it destroyed his family. Don't do what your father did. He doesn't do that. He actually says, when he speaks of Abraham, he says, uh, because Abraham obeyed my voice. He kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. I think it's also interesting that, that uh, this is long before the Mosaic law. So what are the statutes, the commandments of the law? God was already communicating very clearly how he was to be worshiped. We, you know, again, we saw Abraham build altars to make sacrifice, proclaim the name of the Lord, his righteousness, uh, and so forth. Uh, there's a lot that they knew about living for the Lord and what would be pleasing to him long before the Mosaic law ever came along. But again, the key is in verse 3, I will be with you and will, will bless you. And uh, so, so very important to, uh, to remember. I, uh, John Wesley uh, and uh, during his life and ministry in Britain and America, uh, certainly led uh, lots of people to the faith in Christ and a tremendous uh, uh, man of God. And uh, always kind of interesting people's last words, you know, before they're going to be with the Lord. Uh, John Wesley's last words right before he went to be with the Lord were, the best of all is God is with us. The best of all is God is with us. Closed his eyes, went to be with the Lord. Good, a good reminder. That's, that's what God is trying to remind Isaac of. If you find yourself in a famine, <laughs> that means uh, he can't earn a living. That means he can't pay his bills. It means he can't provide for his family. He can't put food on the table to kind of bring it to another reality. That's what's going on. That means everything he's invested in in terms of his flocks and his crops and everything else is, is going away and it's dying and it's disappearing to remember that God is, is with us. So the covenant is reconfirmed. That's the cure for fear, it's faith. And I think in this particular instance, faith to remember and believe that God is with us. Secondly, there's a generational lie that returns and that's in verse six to 11, as we're saying, way to go, Isaac. He didn't go to Egypt, he stayed where God said to go. We're going, great. Well, he kind of turns a corner here. Now. 
keep, I keep in mind the fact that none of us would ever do this. I mean, if God appeared to us, reconfirmed his covenant and how much he loves us and that he's with us, we're just pretty much good to go after that. We don't really stumble or fall or get afraid, but uh, Isaac does. So we'll just kind of follow along with Isaac here. I don't know what's up with him, but in verse 6 it says, So Isaac dwelt in Gerar, that's good, and the men of the place asked about his wife, and he said, She's my sister. <laughs> For he was afraid, he was what? He was afraid to say, she is my wife, because he thought, lest the men of the place kill me for Rebekah, because she is beautiful to behold. Now it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw, and there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously, she is, she is your wife, so how could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, because I said, lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might have soon, soon have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, he who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So the generational lie returns uh, again because well, it's a story that uh, Abraham gave, and on more than one occasion, once when they went to Egypt, once in this setting here in Gerar as well. Remember, the idea, the concept was if, they, if he's married, they could kill him, and then legally, quote, go figure that, but uh, culturally, then it would be acceptable for one of them to take her as, uh, as his wife. Therefore, uh, and apparently with Abraham, this was the thinking all over uh, Mesopotamia and that part of the world at the time because we read of Abraham he says to Sarah when they're leaving uh, Ur of the Chaldeans if this situation comes up this is what we're going to say and, uh, and by the time that happens the second time he's even brought her into the lie and she's even saying to Gerar yeah he's only my brother uh, and yet Isaac had to know the whole story yet he repeats uh, this generational lie. This whole thing comes back again. Why? Well, he was fearful. He said so. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. God was with him. God was going to watch over him. God was going to bring a, a child through him, the Messiah, through whom all the uh, nations of the world would be blessed. Uh, what was he thinking? Well, he was just kind of reacting. Uh, just, just human, just a guy like, uh, like the rest of us. Uh, the the men in the area begin to show an interest, so he comes up with the uh, uh, the story that his uh, own father had used. He certainly understood theologically that God was with him, but uh, he didn't really hold on to it uh, in his heart. Ken Hughes uh, says that recognizing God's presence crushes the temptation to compromise. God's presence puts our fears to flight. It instills confidence and steel. It protects us and our loved ones. It upholds the name of God. Pretty important. And, uh, and he, you know, he, he had it, and then now it's a different threat. You know, it's like, okay, you get a famine thing. Uh, we're okay. We're kind of settled in. I'm not going to Egypt. We're okay. Now there's another threat against my family. I'm just going to compromise a little. And, uh, and he steps back into it, uh, again, being driven by fear. Uh, also, he's rebuked, we would say, uh, for this generational lie. And it comes again from another Abimelech, another pagan king, uh, who had, quote, uh, accidentally discovered the truth from his window as he looked out. And it says there, Isaac was showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife, in verse 8. Uh, NIV uses the term caressing, which gives us a, a better idea, and we could go a whole word study on it, but you get the idea. Whatever he saw, he said, pretty sure that's not your sister. <laughs> why, why have you lied to me? And uh, again, people watch our lives. People were watching him. Uh, he's, a, he's a believer. He knows the one true God. He's the leader of the people that are following the one true God. Uh, and yet... Uh, forgets that there would be eyes upon him. There's eyes on us, aren't there? People kind of watch our, our lives, and especially in a famine, especially in a time of testing. They're, they're really watching us then. Uh, one writer said uh, uh, of this idea of, of people watching us, he says, at times 
I have mused that even our dogs need to be converted and sanctified. Such scrutiny. <laughs> Man, people got their eye on me. I better make sure my dog's even obeying me here, you know. But uh, it is important to lead your dogs to faith in Christ, you know, of course. But uh, some of you are going, I know, and some of you are laughing. But uh, uh, again, people do watch us in, in the details of our lives. The Apostle Paul mourned over God's name being blasphemed when he was reviling believers in the book of Romans in chapter 2 and in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And in Romans 14, 7 says, none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. And the irony in all of this is who ends up protecting Rebecca? Not her husband, but a, but a pagan king. But certainly God was the one orchestrating uh, the events. But Abimelech charged all of his people. He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be touched put to death. Isaac was making a, a mess of things and God was watching over him and straightening things out. And, and he does that. He does it by the grace uh, that he gives to us. It's not because we perform so great. It's not because we deserve it at all. And we we're going to see that in a moment is that when God begins to now bless Isaac, people are kind of ticked off by that. They're, they're actually pretty jealous of that. But Psalm 105, verse 12, talks about this idea. We've read it before in regards to his father. Verse 12, uh, when they were few in number, the Jewish people, indeed very few and strangers in it, in the land, like Abraham and Isaac, when they went from one nation to another, one kingdom to another, which is what Isaac is doing right now, he permitted no one to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sake, saying, do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. That verse 15 certainly is used out of context on a regular basis, but the context is of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob when they're traveling from one nation to another, sometimes when they shouldn't be. Sometimes they should be staying put right where God has them. Uh, and God holds them up and keeps them from even doing something worse. He's still watching over. He's still protecting them. I don't know if you've ever thought about your life before you came to faith in Christ and how many times God watched over you and protected you and kept you until there was a time when you were finally uh, would give your life and surrender your life to him. But uh, the Lord does deal with our sin. He's dealing with uh, Isaac here. Uh, but it's always to better him, to bring him into a closer relationship, to help him understand more the grace of God and what God wants to do in his life. Uh, it's Jeremiah that says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. He says that to backsliding Israel when they're in radical sin. He goes, still got a plan for you. Still want to do something for you. It's not here to harm you. Does he discipline us when we sin? Does he take us to the woodshed? Absolutely, because he loves us. That's what the writer of uh, Hebrews says. Again, Psalm 103, verse 10 says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Amen. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And um, he watches over us as a good father who's got a great heart for uh, for his kids. And when he sees us blowing it, he pities us. Uh, he, he doesn't, he, does, he, does he discipline us? Yeah, but he doesn't punish us like we should get. He doesn't give it to us like we, like we deserve. Uh, but he does, he will try to do what he can to bring us back in the line so that we can live for him uh, and be blessed by him. And we see that going on in the life of Isaac. And the result of that is that well, I think Isaac really does get right with the Lord again. Uh, he realizes at the rebuke that I, this could have happened to my wife. I put my wife in danger. You ever really blow it with the Lord and then the God comes through and kind of bails you out? And you, it's very humbling. You know, it's very humbling. You know, how close you came, how bad it could have been, uh, a bad decision, whatever it might be, some kind of sin in your life. And God intervenes at that moment. It's very humbling. And I think this was a very humble moment for Isaac. And he returns to this idea of the Lord's with me. I can trust the Lord, even here in the land of the Philistines. And uh, I don't have to go with the flow of the rest of the world. So the covenant is reconfirmed. 
uh, as he uh, enters into faith and, and leaves the life of fear. He returns to that life of fear once again, and then he realizes that God is protecting him. And now the Lord can bless him. Verse 12, then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they had uh, filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So Isaac begins to see, receive God's blessing. And it's just a smooth life for him after that, isn't it? No, it's not, actually. Again, just the fact that God is with us, does that mean it's like nobody will ever hassle us? We'll never have a problem. Probably never even have a flat tire again. Jumper cables, throw them away. Probably never. No, it's not really. We still live in a real world. And there's still conflict. And there's still things that, that go on uh, in our lives. And so it's a, it becomes a continual struggle to believe that either God is with us or he's not. God's going to watch over us or, or he's not. I'm either going to live in fear or I'm going to live in, uh, in faith. But here, again, the grace of God, the prosperity. Notice verse 12. Uh, then Isaac sowed in that uh, land and notice reaped in the same year. The same year as what? Same year as the famine. Is that hard to do? Yeah, it's like pretty much impossible. I mean, you're lucky to get any kind of a crop. To sow a hundredfold in a good year with a lot of rain might be possible, not in a time of famine. It becomes very obvious that everybody around him that <laughs> this guy has got something going for him, and it's his relationship with the Lord. It, it's interesting that they realize there must have been something of his life, the way he carried himself. Uh, we'll find him later building altars, proclaiming the name of the Lord like, like Abraham did. There had to be some witness, some testimony. That guy is really different, and what's different is his relationship with the Lord, so that when something like this is happening, the assumption is it's God that's, that's blessing him. That's the, the take that uh, Abimelech gets on the whole thing. But again, this crop is, is uh, abnormal. It's, uh, it's over the top. Uh, and then we're going to see that that uh, there's some vandalism that occurs. Uh, these guys come along and begin to fill in the wells that were dug by Abraham. He knew his father. He knew he'd been there. He knew where they were. He knew where to get water. Again, this is a very arid desert area. Uh, this is kind of like somebody coming along and saying, that's a really nice house you've got, and I'm kind of envious, so I'm going to burn it to the ground. And this is, this is everything, right? This is like... Uh, you're in construction and somebody steals your truck with all of your tools. You can't earn a living. They're, they're filling the well with dirt, uh, making life very difficult. Uh, so again, is God with them? Yeah. Is God blessing them? Sure. Does that mean life is easy? No, it doesn't mean it at all. It was a constant battle for him to constantly reaffirm uh, what was going on in his own heart, if the Lord was really with him or not. Uh, and notice again, verse 14, so the Philistines envied him. And I think the reason they envy him is because, well, I don't think he really deserved it. I mean, you know, I don't think the guy was a great farmer, necessarily. I don't think that the guy was a great herdsman, necessarily. Uh, and the, the guy certainly wasn't uh, always honoring the Lord in the way he lived his life. Uh, lies, everybody would know about that. Uh, and that's kind of a tough one, isn't it? When somebody that maybe isn't the person with great integrity, and they're really not the, the most scrupulous businessman. And it sure seems like they're making a lot of money, and they, have, and they are prospering. Our, our reaction usually is not to say, well, well, praise the Lord, you know, I mean, they're kind of a jerk, but I'm just happy anytime somebody's making a lot. No, our tendency is like, what is up with that? You know, and we're to, we envy you know, the psalmist writes about the fact that he looked upon the wicked and saw their prosperity and he begins to doubt God and he goes through this downward spiral and he says, and I almost slipped beyond, my, beyond hope in my relationship with the Lord. He says, then I enter the sanctuary of the Lord. I begin to see things from an eternal perspective. And he comes back around. It's easy. It's easy to go there. But uh, envy plays quite a, quite a role here. 
uh, because of what's going on, in verse 17 to 22, we'll say that he repeatedly dug new wells. And this in itself is, is a, a miraculous thing uh, as well. Then Isaac departed from there, verse 17, and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells with uh, which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. And Isaac's uh, servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Asik, uh, because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called that one Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well. Uh, and they did not quarrel over it, so he called the name of it Rehoboth, uh, because he said, from now, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful uh, in the land. So we note that he's successful in repeatedly digging new wells. You think that'd be kind of a tough thing to do in a desert in a, in a famine? That'd be kind of hard. I mean, he, he goes back and unearths. No, he just brought the backhoe in. I'm sure it was a very easy task. No, I mean, hand dig this thing out. They finally get water out of it. They're going to survive. You got to have water to survive. They're going to survive. And then uh, these guys come along and said, no, that's ours. Uh, you know, and he even names them what his father named him. He didn't rename them because he was basically claiming ownership. This is the well my father dug. He called it this. That's what I'm calling it because it's our well. And then these guys show up. No, it's ours. So he moves on. They unearth uh, another one. And uh, I hope they bought the back home and we're just renting it. You know what I mean? And then uh, unearth that one, uh, get water again, calls it the name again. It's ours. It's my father's well. It's Abraham's well. These guys show up. No, that's ours. And, uh, and he goes on, on and on, moving from one place uh, to another. Uh, the first well he called Asik, which means contention. Uh, the second one, Sitna, means hostility, open hostility. We're about ready to have a war over, over this whole thing. But everywhere the guy goes, he finds water. And, uh, and, he, and then he has to move again. He finds water again. And then they go and they find a spring. This is all tough, very tough to do in the middle of the desert, especially in a famine. Uh, but obviously God was with him. God was directing him. God was taking care of him. But he had to keep believing that through this whole process. Open hostility. It's, uh, it's difficult. I don't know if you've ever had somebody really, really threaten you, uh, threaten you that way. Uh, it's just interesting how just even the words of threat, you know, can really... Uh, can really kind of rock, rock your world. And we, you know, we, our house in Connie always at the end of the street, which uh, is, uh, was kind of good when Kathy and I were both self-employed and, you know, has a little bit more of a rural feel and we working at home, didn't have to worry about disturbing our neighbors and, uh, and stuff. Uh, but the uh, couple of drawbacks is that uh, one of them, it's where uh, people, uh, if they get tired of fighting their, uh, their, their chickens, they drop them off at the end of the street. So I became a professional rooster catcher, uh, over 50 to my credit. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, but uh, so that's one of the drawbacks because uh, roosters that fight are really weird. They're pretty skitsy. They crow all night long. So you get sleep deprivation, you know, as picking out which gun I was going to use. And uh, my wife convinced me to go for the trap instead. But... Uh, the, I did catch one of my neighbors walking down the street at 3 o'clock in the afternoon with a rifle in her, in her hand <laughs> looking for a rooster. It's like, hey, man, sister, get him, you know. But uh, so it's kind of nice, you know, the little country thing. But the other thing is that people would uh, drop their, their junk cars off, you know, as they would uh, body shop somewhere, strip them for parts, you know, tow them down there. and drop. That's, you know, a beautiful thing to have in front of your home is, you know, a, a junk, uh, junk car. Now, if you get one, you know what you get then? Two or three. Uh, they multiply somehow. Somebody sees it and goes, that's a good place. No, I don't kid. I mean, if you don't do something right away, you got three. I mean, within, within days. So that's another little tip if you're looking for real estate, maybe. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, I was, uh, you know, I actually had the nerve. I actually saw a guy dumping a car in front of my house. And I actually had the nerve to go over and say, please don't do that. <laughs> you know, and uh, just, you know, do me a favor. 
take it to the school. The school will call the police and that thing will be out of there next day. If I call, they're gonna put this tag on it, they're gonna wait three weeks and I got three more cars and you know the rest of the story. So I said, could you just please move it down the street? And he kind of uh, gave, gave me a bunch of lip uh, over that and everything. <clears throat> and uh, so then I, uh, what did I do? I, I wrote down his license number. So then it's like, I go, you know, I got this. I'm not going to call him. I just want you to move it. I don't want any hassle and everything. Then he went ballistic and let me know that he was going to come back later and burn my house to the ground. He had a, threw in a few uh, other uh, adjectives that went along with that. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to, uh, to give a direct quote, but uh, he was a little agitated. But uh, it's, you know, I didn't really think he would do it, but it's amazing how those words, I'll come back later and burn your house to the ground. That's really not a hard thing to do. You know, I don't have like six feet of barbed wire around my house and, you know, six watchdogs, you know, like Mark does at his house out there, you know. <laughs> but uh, I'm not really set up, you know, for range warfare, you know. And uh, it's just amazing how that, you know, that fear, I mean, just a little thing can just get in the back of your mind. Because what if he did that? I mean, what if he did burn the thing, you know, what would happen and where would be, you know, and how long it would take and rebuilding and insurance and, you know, you really trust those guys, you know, and, you know, uh, you know how's this all going to work out? Sorry if you're an insurance guy, but uh, the, uh, uh, you know, it's just, it can keep you up at night. You know, little comments by people uh, can keep you up at night. Uh, Isaac is, is going through all of this, except it's somebody is burning his house down by by taking those wells that's the livelihood that's how you survive and he's got to go again and go again and go again it kind of wear on you wouldn't it but at the same time by like the fifth time he goes and they dig and they find water again is he starting to think i'm pretty sure if this happens god's gonna give you know give us some more water I'm pretty sure, I was like, he's done it like four times in a row. I'm pretty sure if we have to move down the road and dig in the ground again, I'm pretty sure we're going to find water. I don't know why. It's just because we've done it five times in a row. It is not me. I'm not a good water finder. God just keep, kind of keeps doing it. You understand what would kind of be going through his mind, the blessing out the other side of this? And, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's amazing. But again, testing with the blessing. Sometimes the blessing is through the pathway of the trial and the testing itself. Uh, and so he gets to a place where he says, verse 22, hey, for now the Lord's made room for us. For now, it's okay. We got, if we got to move it down the road again, it's okay. But for now, hey, he's made room for us. We're going we're gonna to be fruitful in this land. So he calls it uh, Rehoboth, which means room. We got plenty of room. We can be fruitful here. The Lord can, can bless here. He just needed to hang in there and keep persevering and trusting the Lord. But he's growing through the process. Is he doing good? He's doing good. Watch this, though. Verse 23. <laughs> he's going to get two peace offerings. One's from the Lord. The other one's from Abimelech. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear. Why does he say that? Because <laughs> he's probably still dealing with it. And I am with you, because he needed to be reminded of that. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there, called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Fikal, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hate me and sent me away from you? Other than that, it's really nice to see you. Uh, but they said, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. Uh, so we said, let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now uh, the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank, and then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. It came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug and said, we found water again. No, it doesn't say that. Verse 33. So he called it Sheba, or uh, therefore the name of the city is Beersheba or Beersheba 
uh, to this day. So the first offering of peace certainly is from the Lord. Verse 24, I am the God of your father. Abraham, do not fear. I am with you. And he responds, verse 25, so he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. Even as Abraham did many times, if we kind of followed him, and certainly uh, Abraham is, is, uh, is at his best uh, when we think about the fact that what his life was known for is he was a pilgrim, he lived in tents, and he built altars and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And when he's doing that, it means he's proclaiming the righteousness of God and the character of God. We might say preaching the gospel, but it's not quite the same thing, but it's the idea. Here's the one true God who created everything, and he deserves to be worshipped. And this is how we do it. And when Abraham did it, there's 400 people standing around. He had quite the uh, entourage that uh, was part of his family and traveled with him. And we find Isaac doing the same thing here. Uh, and it's, it's quite a statement. Uh, you, you have to kind of get that little part, though, that when, when these guys then, you know, it's so good. You know, it's like, you know, he's, he's really doing awesome things. He's do, really doing something for the Lord, man. He's telling people about God and about God's righteous. He's worshiping in public. I don't care what anybody else thinks. We're going for it with the Lord. You know, Isaac, all right. And then these guys show up. What do you want? <laughs> Lost that piece just there a little bit, you know. Uh, I know that you hate me. Uh, no, actually, that's not it. We're here to kind of have a covenant with you. Uh, we're actually kind of afraid of you when it comes right down to it because we see God's with you. You may not feel it right now. You may not sense it right now, but we can kind of tell. You know, if you thought about it recently, your life and what's going on, but uh, we can kind of tell. Because people look at you and go, I don't have a family like yours. You know, I don't have your life. And, uh, you know, if you, if you got a wife and kids at home and you eat dinner once in a while, you're like a mile ahead of, of most of the people in the culture, by the way. And they look upon you sometimes in, uh, in amazement. I remember uh, Dr. Walter Smith, who was one of the more brilliant men of his, uh, his generation, a research uh, scientist and several PhDs. And uh, we were, had the privilege of hearing him, <coughs> brought him over to Hawaii on a few occasions. For some reason, we could never get someone to debate him on the uh, issue of creation and evolution. They would kind of look at his credentials and go, I think I'm busy that weekend. And uh, we, so we could never get a, a debate going, but he would come in uh, and lecture and everything. Brilliant man, wrote all these books and, uh, and then uh, and, and research work, of course. Uh, and he said, though, uh, their, their greatest and most effective tool for evangelism that they saw in the course of their lives for him and his wife was to have other, their friends' kids over for dinner because their friends' kids would show up and spend the weekend and, and then hug them when they left and went, thank you, I've never experienced this. Just a family and the, you guys interaction and you pray together and I, I've never seen this before. Can you tell me more about this? It, he said, that was our most, it's like Mr. Apologetics, PhD guy. He says, that was our best, that was the best deal we did in terms of being a witness for, for the Lord and having an impact on someone. And these guys show up to Isaac and say, I don't know if you're sensing it right now or what's going through your mind. And no, we don't hate you. In fact, we see God's with you. And we're kind of concerned for our own safety here. You know, there's a, a proverb that says, you know, when a, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. And that, that's what's going on right here with, with Isaac. He doesn't have it all together. I mean, he's, he's kind of, he falters here a little bit and stuff, but, but generally he's staying where God wanted him to do, trying to do what God wants him to do. And he's growing through this process of, I get it and they take it away. I get it and they take it away. And I get it and take it away. He could have become pretty cynical at that point. He could have been going, I don't know where you are, God, but I don't know if you knows what I'm going through here. I mean, you know, you can go that way, but instead he just went, we'll just dig another well. We'll just dig another well. Have reason to believe God's going to give us another well. Uh, and he just kind of goes on about it after a while. So the second peace offering, again, is from Abimelech. They come to cut covenant, very similar to what was uh, taking place with, uh, with Abraham. They recognize the Lord's with them. They desire a covenant of peace. Therefore, he calls that place Beersheba, again, the well of the oath where the covenant uh, uh, is uh, taken, taken place. And uh, 
again, God's working through the life of this man. Now, what's interesting now is that I feel like we should kind of just, uh, you know, end the story right there. But you have these other couple of verses here thrown on the end about Esau. Now, you remember Esau? He's the guy that's a living beer commercial. You know, just an outstanding young man who's uh, idolatrous and an adulterer or fornicator, uh, Hebrews tells us. And, uh, and yet he's, uh, he's his dad's favorite kid. Uh, we're going to find out that he's going to get married here. And, uh, and he's 40 years old, which makes Isaac 100. You know, so it's some, probably some, a big gap here between, uh, between verse 33 and 34, certainly. But there it says, as we'll see, two marriage relationships that bring grief. Uh, when Esau was 40 years old, he took wives, Judith, the daughter of Barry the Hittite, and Bashmoth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they were a grief of mine to Isaac and Rebekah. Why were they such a grief of mine? Well, because he married two Canaanites. And Abraham had already said early on, uh, about his own son, whatever happens, don't let him marry a Canaanite. I, I think word probably got around that that's what you not want to do, but then, the, you know, Esau does it, uh, does it anyway. Uh, and it becomes, uh, again, a, a warning of this guy that, man, Isaac was his father, you know, uh, Abraham was his grandfather. He had everything going for him, uh, but he just decides to go his own way, to do his own thing. And uh, as we read last week in Hebrews, in the end, he, he repented with tears, but there was no repentance to be found. It was like too late for him, and there was never really a true turning of the heart. Uh, and he's the sad story in the contrast with what's going on here with Isaac and with, uh, with Esau. Uh, again, I think the reference is made for a warning to us and the reminder that we need to we do need to believe and trust that God is with us uh, at all times. One writer said that uh, God is all present. There is no place where all of God is not. All of God is, is everywhere. And he is specially present to protect and bless his children. Of course, that protection is always there. But the path of blessing may be through testing. Because that's when we, we really learn to trust him. And... Uh, uh, is the uh, word and words we quote that uh, uh, I like to refer to is that uh, a faith that is not tested is a faith that is not trusted. And God just wants us to see how faithful he is. And sometimes the only way that we can do that is to put us up in a more desperate circumstance so we can see that even in a famine, even in a tremendous test, even when open hostility against us, God said, I'll still be faithful. Just try me and see. You can trust me. We can head down to Egypt. There's a crowd going down there. Highway's full. You can just get in line. You could do that. But I'm kind of pleading with you. Would you just kind of stay right here where I can bless you and protect you and watch over? Not going to be easy, but open hostility. It's all right. Contentious people around you. But I know there's very few of those in the islands. But uh, there's a few. And they all drive cars, too. I don't know why, but uh, they're out there. But uh, God will, will be with us. God will watch over us.
Your own. 